to your choice. So I think we're going to move on now to the first presentation by uh, Christopher Driscoll, who's going to present a talk entitled The Use of NLP for Healthcare Education Using Simulated and Virtual Patients. Uh, Christopher Driscoll has a background in biomedical and mechanical engineering, and he's been developing medical simulators for the past nine years at CAE Healthcare. He currently holds the position of lead solutions architect, and he's worked in the past in the fields of uh, human performance research, health promotion education, and um, aerospace engineering as well. So, uh, Christopher, if you want, you can try and, and share your screen. Okay. Um, let me know if you can see it. Yes, it's perfect. Thank you so much. You so so much. the floor is yours, Christopher. Okay. So yeah, thanks uh, for having me. So uh, my name is Christopher Driscoll. I work at uh, CE Healthcare. So just to put into context, uh, I'm not a natural language processing expert by any means. My background is in biomedical engineering. Uh, but in my talk today, I'll show uh, an application, I guess, that we used at CE Healthcare and the specific uh, difficulties and some challenges that we face and how we overcome it and some other challenges um, that we hope to overcome in the future. So just a, a bit about CAE. Um, you might know it uh, more on the aviation side. So they're most well known for flight simulators. So they have different uh, tiers of flight simulators. Some is, uh, you know, computer base up to like a full cockpit on hydraulics that moves when you fly and stuff like that. So there's the civil aviation side. There's also defense and security for you know fighter jets, helicopters, drones, all kinds of stuff um, on uh, the military side. And then a smaller part of um, CAE is CAE Healthcare. So about um, 12 years ago or 11 years ago, it started and it's uh, kind of the smaller brother of the other two. Um, but uh, CAE Healthcare is growing and we have uh, quite a few products. So the main objective is to make uh, simulators um, for different different applications or different kinds of simulators. Uh, but the two um, where kind of um, speech is important are the patient simulators. So CA sells um, both physical on the right over here and uh, digital on the left uh, patient simulators. So the physical patient simulators is like a, a mannequin, but it's an intelligent mannequin. It has like all kinds of features like pulses that you can feel. You can do CPR. It'll detect, you know, how deep you can press and the rhythm. You can intubate it. You can ventilate it. So you can interact it with it with all kinds of interesting ways. And then driving the mannequin is a, a facilitator or instructor software uh, that we call Maestro. And there's a physiology engine running that determines the, the patient's vital signs. And the instructor can kind of trigger certain events to happen on the mannequin and there's sensors and the instructor gets feedback of like, you know, what the, um, the students are doing with the mannequin. So for a long time, uh, you know, this is the most popular product of CE. There's different types of mannequins, babies, pediatrics, you know, uh, pregnant ladies for birthing simulators, uh, military mannequins. Uh, but more recently, we started making digital uh, versions of these mannequins. And um, there's a few different ways uh, that they train with the digital mannequins. So one is there's still an instructor. Um, so the students will log in remotely and the instructor logs in. And it's still the instructor behind the scenes driving the simulation of what happens with the mannequin, you know, how their vital signs uh, change. And you can do like virtual interventions like give medications or oxygen and stuff like that. And we also have some self-directed modules where it's more like a, a video game and there's no instructors behind the scenes and there's some type of scripting um, going on with the, the mannequin. And of course, um, part of the interventions that are done both with the physical mannequin and the digital mannequin are speaking, so talking. So on the right over here, we see kind of the setup for um, the physical mannequin. So right now, uh, typically there's an instructor 
that drives a show. Sometimes they're behind a, a, a one-way mirror type of thing, or sorry, a two-way mirror. So they can see what's going on and they're like driving the simulation experience and they're able to speak through the mannequin. So they can have a headset, there's a speaker and a microphone on the mannequin and they can you know, talk as if they were the patient. Or there's that uh, instructor software that I was talking about. They can kind of pre-script certain texts, but it's basic. You know, they can make the mannequin say no, scream, ow, like different type of things like that. But it really, you need an instructor uh, to do this or else the mannequin's not talking. And then for our digital version, um, specifically for self-directed, you know, you have to be able to talk to the patient, to talk to other healthcare providers uh, that might be in the room. And what we have now is essentially a, a pick list of uh, questions. So, you know, you open up a list and you ask questions. Uh, how are you feeling? This and that. So one of the drawbacks with this type of, you know, pick list implementation is, you know, it's not representative of a, a real life because, you know, in a real case, you don't have a multiple choice question of kind of the things that you want to say. Uh, and sometimes it might give away what's wrong, you know, like in some scenarios, let's say you have to vocalize a diagnosis, but then if there's only one diagnosis, then it's obviously what the answer was. So we have to like be careful. And sometimes we put confounding dialogues that are incorrect and stuff like that. But then even then it remains, you know, a multiple choice question instead of like a free type of thing. Um, one of the things to mention is when they're training on a physical mannequin, usually it's a group type of thing. So there might be four students like kind of treating the patient as a group. And self-directed, it's usually uh, one person. And uh, the details of this flow diagram are important, but when people are training both on the physical and the digital mannequins, there's uh, this concept of um, simulate clinical experience for SEs. But all it is is a, a series of states that the patient goes through. And in each state, you can do things like change the vital signs or trigger events, like the patient stops breathing or, or stuff like that. So behind the scenes, uh, there is a state flow diagram that the student is going through, even though they don't really know about it. And in our software that drives it, we have the opportunity to kind of make things happen and change things at each of the states. So if there's a need, to change like the dialogue options, for example, or the way that the patient responds, then uh, we do through, so through the, the state diagram. And the state diagram, it's not only something that we at CA create, um, but we have a, a means for learners to create their own SCs so they can actually author this type of state flow diagram. So what are the training needs associated uh, to communication in like our CA healthcare application? So one is communicating with the patient and family members. So in a lot of the scenarios, you know, there's something wrong with the patient and you have to figure out what's wrong. So you have to ask pertinent questions to the patient about their, you know, their medical history, their background, if they're on any medication, what are their symptoms and stuff like that. So you have to figure out and it's a very important aspect of it uh, to talk to the patient. You also have to be able to, uh, you know, talk to family members, let's say if the patient is kind of sedated or whatever uh, in a similar manner. And you also have to be able to convey information to the patient. So if there's a certain treatment plan uh, that you want them to follow or advice that they need to follow and stuff like that, it's not just about asking questions and getting answers. It's about, you know, giving advice or, um, Kind of treatment plans and also proper bedside manner is a, a training need so uh, we made uh, some screen based modules for the american society of anesthesiologists here's an example on the right and in some of them like there's one case where there is um, the patient is on uh, life support and um, there's a scenario where they have a, a do not resuscitate uh, kind of order but then a family member comes in and in a scenario, you're actually supposed to like communicate with the family member and explain stuff like that around. So it's like sensitive discussions going on. And for sure, through a pick list, it, it would have been much better if we supported at the time kind of open communication. Uh, so the way that you talk, you know, you don't want to use jargon when talking to the family. Uh, you want to do it in a sensitive manner and efficiently. 
and then there's communicating with other healthcare professionals. So a lot of the scenarios, if you're playing the role of anesthesiologist, for example, you're not in the room by yourself treating the patient, there's other people with it, and you have to delegate tasks. Oh, can you please ventilate this? Can you please go get this medication? I need a cart. Okay, everyone stand back. So it's communicating with uh, multiple people in the room to kind of coordinate the care of the patient. Um, so there was a need and a desire um, to support, you know, AI driven open ended dialogue capabilities, both on our physical and virtual patients. And there's a few um, things that probably other applications care about, but we cared about specifically that we thought might be specific. So one is medical jargon. So there's a lot of terms like uh, I need epinephrine, 2cc, like so that might not be in certain uh, standard dictionaries. Um, there is also the multiple learners. So there's, you know, around the physical mannequins, four learners um, at the same time. So, you know, are they talking to the patient? Are they talking to each other? Uh, so the need to kind of differentiate uh, who's talking to who and if it's pertinent for that specific person. One of the things that we also thought of is uh, we wanted to convey the fact that the patient has symptoms. And then there was a debate on two approaches. One is we have that state flow diagram, so we can just say uh, when you're in state two, your symptom is drowsy, you know, or state three, your symptom is agitated. But we also thought, well, what if we automatically generate the symptoms based on the vital signs? So we started looking at, OK, well, you know, if you have an ele elevated heart rate, uh, what does that mean? Well, you know, or a high blood pressure, it probably means you're agitated. So we kind of did a mapping between the vital signs that our physiological model is outputting and what symptoms uh, that the patient should have. So if ever, you know, you're asking the patient, what are your symptoms? There could be some type of lookup based on vital signs and they would say it. Because that ended up being, uh, I guess, more trouble than it was worth. So it like the prototype that we ended up developing, uh, we just put, you know, uh, a direct symptom per uh, state planarial uh, state, but this is something interesting that we might want to do. Um, the, the, the responses need to change. So in some type of chatbots, you know, the answer is always the same, but the patient might get worse. Uh, you know, we might want to give the students hints. So after a certain amount of time, uh, maybe the patient spontaneously says something to give them a hint. So the type of responses and the type of symptoms uh, in the dialogue need to change as the scenario progresses. We also want to have variable responses based on conversation history. So if you know the conversation started and the patient said, oh, my chest hurts. And then if you asked, do you have any other symptoms? Well, we don't want the patient to repeat, well, my chest hurts and my head hurts and my arm hurts. We wanted to say exclude something that they already answered, for example, to make it more uh, realistic in terms of uh, conversation. Um, yeah, so we were able to do this in the, the prototype that we made. One thing that we weren't able to do yet, but we want to do is voice modulation based on symptoms. So, you know, uh, to have a realistic experience instead of just having the standard, you know, voice generations like poly or whatever we want. One day we would like to have, you know, if the patient's drowsy, while well, their voice changes, if they're confused or if they're short of breath, like the way they speak is going to change. Because um, that would not only be realistic, but also help, I guess, the people train on how to kind of like associate voice characteristics to symptoms. And then another kind of constraint for CA Healthcare is uh, like it's a global company that sells uh, to many different markets all over the world. And sometimes, um, you know, like people in healthcare tend to uh, travel a lot and stuff like that. So you could have a team of people around a physical mannequin from different locations in the world that might have accents and stuff like that. And one of the other things uh, that's important because these are, we make simulators, and, you know, they're there to train on, but they're also, um, we usually provide uh, metrics at the end and they're, they're used for assessment and scoring and stuff like that. So here's an example of scoring that we have right now with our pick list type of implementation. Um, so basically it just tracks, you know, the dialogues that you selected and then at the end 
you get a score and then uh, I lost one point. Why did I lose? Because I use medical jargon when discussing with the son and we give a little explanation, but this is pretty simplistic in terms of feedback. So where we want to go is evaluate how efficient um, someone's conversations were with the patient. Like, did you start asking questions that had nothing to do with the diagnosis and it took really long to kind of get there? Um, so, you know, the intelligence of the questions or stuff like that you're asking the patient, it would be really interesting to be able to kind of uh, keep track of those. And as well, there's kind of standard protocols um, in terms of the sequencing of questions or the questions that you're supposed to ask. So to be able to assess if someone's actually following those protocols, all that would be great. Um, so we we started making a, a proof of concept, uh, a prototype to see uh, what could be done. And um, it was a, a relatively short one, but uh, we'll show a, a little demo at the end of what we got. And then I'll, I'm just going to talk about uh, now the journey of kind of what we did to get there. Um, so the first, because there's many uh, applications in healthcare, but the first kind of one that we thought of is, okay, well, someone shows up to the emergency room with symptoms, in this case, check, uh, chest pain. So then we started looking at, well, okay, what's what type of standard interview questions uh, would there be to someone to showing up, you know, to chest pain or asthma in the emergency room? So we looked at a bunch of interview guides and standard protocols of, uh, you know, what the questions would be asked. Then we kind of made a, a little flow diagram. So normally it breaks down to, you know, what the complaint is, and then it, you're supposed to ask them about their family history, their own past medical history, if they have allergies to medications, what medications are on, what their social history is, you know, if they're smoking, exercising, and stuff like that. And some of them are, you know, relatively straightforward, like how old are you and stuff like that. So it's like, you know, somewhat easy to know what the expected response is. But some of the questions are like, well, where does it hurt? You know, OK, my chest hurts. But then there's like follow ups that are a little bit more difficult to imagine how to handle. Uh, like when did it start hurting? You know, does anything make the symptoms better? Does anything make the symptoms worse? On a scale of one to ten, how much how much does it hurt? OK, describe the pain. Is it sharp pain? Is it radiant pain? Is it dull pain? you know, as an intermittent pain. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, follow up or subtleties to the type of uh, answers that could be given to questions. Um, and all along we knew that, so this is our um, SE, the, the clinical scenario editor, where you kind of like author your own scenario and all along we were thinking like how are we going to allow people to kind of input their own answers to the questions that they want the patient to answer you know so like right now it's pretty basic we put in the name the gender the age blah 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 but we want to kind of expand this to allow people to say okay well you know what is your frequency of mo uh, smoking uh, what are your symptoms where does it hurt what type of hurt it is so we're kind of thinking in the back always like, OK, well, this has to work with an authoring tool because we can't do it uh, all the time for for people because they're making their own scenarios like clients make their own scenarios on the management. Uh, so we worked uh, with a, a company that maybe, you know, uh, FPT software. I believe they're based uh, out of Vietnam and uh, they're quite good, so they helped us uh, developed a proof of concept. Uh, so in this architecture diagram, like the the CA maestro is is here pretty much, and we're feeding through an API the list of inputs that you could enter um, in maestro concerning the patient, all their symptoms, their medical history, and stuff like that. And then the user is just the learner, so the learner is able if they're around the mannequin or if they're on a screen to either talk or if they're on the screen they can type it into the tech language and then it processes it using the natural language engine and then responds with what it's supposed to be so that you know the top is pretty standard and the main thing that we are working on with FTP is for our specific uh, application 
you know, getting the intents and the entities and the QA model to work uh, to something that's that's good. Um, so, you know, based on that kind of uh, interview guide and all the type of questions that were asked, this is like a, a subset. But the, the different intents that were identified, you know, is the action, age, allergies, body, family history. So all these over here is the, the kind of intents that we believe someone would want to ask a patient when do, doing their assessment. And it's like I mentioned, a subset of the list, but this is what we developed for the, the proof of concept. And then the entities for each of these uh, are here. And like I mentioned, some are, are pretty straightforward, like, you know, age, okay. And then you're, you're looking for a number. Um, but the more kind of difficult ones were, you know, the, the symptoms or the, the times related to symptoms of like to go into more detail of like to expand upon the symptoms and what impacts them and how long they've been there. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically we needed to train uh, different ways to kind of ask the intent. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you know more about this than I do, but we had to create any possible permutation of question um, that we can think of associated to age. You know, like how many different ways can someone ask someone how old they are? How many different ways can you ask someone in this example that's shown here of like what actions improve your symptoms or make your symptoms worse? Um, so for each kind of one of those intents, we tried to come up with a large, large number. And then we had to say what the answer was uh, for that specific scenario. So initially, uh, we had, uh, you know, about 20, 25 for each, uh, 25 to 30 example questions, I guess, or ways to kind of um, have the intent recognized. But it didn't really work uh, perfect at first. Uh, there's a couple examples of wrong uh, below. So in the first example that it was wrong initially is, you know, do you have any idea what may trigger your symptom? And even though the true intent was the action kind of that triggers the symptom, because we didn't have enough questions uh, to train the model, it was predicting that you're asking what your symptoms are. In the second example that was wrong for the entity recognition, if the question was, uh, are you fatigued all the time? it didn't necessarily predict that uh, fatigue was a type of symptom. So then the answer, like I'm sure often is, is to populate with even more data of uh, example questions and uh, what the answers would be. So we were asked to pretty much double it. Uh, so we did, and then it gave uh, kind of better behavior. And then uh, I'll kind of show you the result. Hopefully the sound comes through. And you can speak to the patient to get information. Hello, what is your name? I am Michael Parkins. Hello, Michael. How old are you? I am 53. And what brings you to the hospital today? I don't feel good. Can you tell me your symptoms? I feel mild chest tightness, shortness of breath, fatigued, lightheaded. When did the shortness of breath start? My shortness of breath has started since two days ago. How long have you felt fatigued? My fatigue has started since one week ago. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is the pain? I think 4. Can you tell me about your medical history? I had type 2 diabetes since the age of 45. Are you taking any medications? I take insulin regularly. Can you tell me about your family medical history? My father had heart issues, including a failed transplant that led to his death at age 62. Are you, uh, sorry, 
Do you have any allergies? Cat, penicillin. Um, you could ask random questions too. Do you like bananas? Oh, sorry. I do not understand the question. So anything that we didn't train it, the kind of how to respond, it's going to uh, respond with that generic answer. Then uh, you can change states. And uh, we didn't change that much in state two. It was more just so that we can change the answers. But for example, if I ask it about the pain, I should get a different answer. Previously, it was four. On a scale of one to 10, how bad is your pain? About seven. Do you smoke? I smoke one pack a week. How often do you exercise? I like walking, normally a few days a week. Does anything make your pain worse? The pain gets worse when I move. Does anything improve your symptoms? Nothing improves my symptoms. Yeah, so, I mean, this and you can speak to the patient. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So it's not perfect, but uh, people seemed, I guess, happy with the proof of concept and uh, it's something that we definitely want to pursue. So the next phase um, that we'd like to do is start making more scenarios and addressing some of those um, specific use cases that I mentioned or th those issues. And yeah, we hope uh, to integrate that uh, into our products. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher. Um, there seems to be some sort of echo on your side, maybe. Um, so um, we have about uh, eight minutes uh, for questions. Uh, you can ask uh, your questions to Christopher uh, in English or French, uh, or you can type them in your chat if you want. Um, so uh, you can use the raise hand tool in the upper right uh, corner of uh, Teams to uh, ask question. Uh, and I see that we already have uh, one question from Alexander Bustamante. So Alexander, you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you wish. Sure, I'll try to do that. Hi, Christopher. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. It was quite interesting. So if I understood correctly, you're using the Luis uh, as your uh, chatbot, right, for for uh, for your proof of concept. So uh, I'm curious about uh, how much of a black box Luis is. So are you able to um, uh, configure it with custom architectures for 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 to train different models, or are you just using you know uh, whatever it's offered by by Azure in that sense? Yeah, it's not being uh, customized so much uh, at the moment for the proof of concept, and I like I don't think that you can uh, to a certain extent there, but it okay. seemed to meet the need um, at least so far. And you can train it for sure with like the intents there and uh, the entities, but uh, I think other than that, it's it's not really open to us. Okay, thank you. We have a question in the chat. So Leo is asking, um, do you record, do you record dialogue for, from the use of the simulators in order to augment the training data set? We didn't so far, but it's a, a really good idea. So we have like um, a debriefing tool uh, called Learning Space that kind of uh, records with video cameras and the audio that usually instructors kind of after like point out, ah, oh, you should have done that here or stuff like that. But we could uh, kind of extract the, the questions, I guess, that are most typical uh, from that. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting uh, suggestion. It's because to follow up on uh, Leo's question, uh, 
from the use of these uh, virtual patients, uh, you derive you can derive uh, quite in, in an interesting data set of the interactions between the, the patient and the doctor. It could uh, create new questions, but also it could train a system to uh, uh, to find the right intents and uh, the, the state transitions uh, within the, the, the dialogue system. Uh, a bit like uh, Reza X is doing uh, right now. Yeah, like one of the challenges was uh, coming up with all those like permutations of questions and stuff like that. And it's like manual, you know, like someone had to like think of them and enter them. But yeah, it's something we didn't consider. But looking for sources of already existing stuff and using that would be much more efficient, I think. So I have a question of my own. Um, so um, you uh, you're using uh, Lewis right now. Uh, what made you choose that particular solution? There are many like 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 it. So it was um, like it was our partners there at TP that uh, recommended it. They um, I think they they developed solutions for others as well in the past, and they were more familiar with that system. So it was just based on their, I guess, history and recommendation. I see. Uh, what kind of uh, medical conditions can you simulate right now? Uh, um, there seems to be uh, a data set that you have to build manually for each uh, kind of symptoms. So it's quite task consuming. I suppose that you focused on the most uh, important or significant uh, kinds of symptoms that one patient can can show. Yeah, we did chest pain and asthma pretty much so far. Uh, but there, like you're right, there's uh, we have those SCEs. We have like hundreds of them kind of. And it's a little bit uh, daunting if you think about it to like come up with uh, you know, for each of those, like all the questions, because some questions are like the same, you know, like how old are you? Uh, do you smoke? What's your history? But others that are like specific to the, uh, the pathology or whatever the patient has. It's um, there are guides. So we have um, we have clinical educators with uh, different backgrounds that could help. And they, they gave us some like interview guides and the interview guides. They kind of have like a symptom specific questions that we can look at. So that's a, a helpful source, I guess. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Tufik Mishuma who asks, does the dialogue is a sort of next sentence like in BERT or is there a conceptual representation of words? Um, I guess uh, I don't know if you could uh, I don't know if I understand the question. Uh, like, does it like respond right away to the the sentence, or does it like allow them to build up before responding? Uh, the way we do it in BERT is just the next sentence generation, whatever for discourse generation or question answering. So we will be saying sentence A correspond to the sentence B. Is it the same way? as you are doing right now, or there is a conceptual representation behind the symptoms. Or just a set of words that correspond to the another set of words. I don't know. Do you see what I mean? I think so. Like it's not uh, it's not like a lookup table of like, oh, this is uh, the question. So this is the answer. There's uh, it's impacted by the the state data that says what the symptoms are for that state type of thing so it'll drive if it says like what are your symptoms depending on the state it'll look at what the states are for that symptom and there was also the notion of history that we introduce so if it said like if you already said something like you would your answer would be different if you didn't already say it so okay. like the example i said like oh my chest hurts do you have any other symptoms then it won't say the exact same sentence as like, what are your symptoms? Because it, it'll remember that you already talked about it and then it's going to like modify the answer. Okay, right. Thank you. 
Leo has another question in the chat. He asks, uh, what kind of internal library or dialogue model do you use? Is it developed in-house or from somewhere else? For instance, speech acts would be a good addition. For now, it was uh, just something that we developed uh, in-house. I'm not familiar with the uh, speech acts, but I uh, could look at it if it's uh, something that's useful or common. Great. I see that there's another question. Someone has raised his hand. Um, so we have a question from Frédéric Bivon. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I had a question. I saw that in your example. I'm not sure. I think you repeated the same question. Um, was it the same answer the patient gave? Oh, like, yeah, because I asked him, um, what's the pain on a scale of one to 10 or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it changed the second time. OK, so um, do you know if there would be a way to kind of control the randomness of the answers, given the fact that uh, like a real patient would always give the same answer normally? Um, yeah. It was um, it was done on purpose because I don't know if you noticed, but there was like a, that drop down menu where I changed from state one to state two. So in state one, if I asked like on one to ten, what is it? It was always been seven and in state two, it would have always been like four, I guess. But it could have. Yeah, I guess some uh, some type of questions could benefit from a randomness in the answer. So it's uh, it's more realistic there. Uh, yeah, and we didn't implement that, but it's an interesting concept because yeah, humans aren't uh, yeah. consistent the way they answer. Right? Yeah, I guess in some cases, cases like pain could be sometimes different from one moment to another, but in sometimes like uh, questions like your age would be the same. So I guess it's a very difficult uh, aspect to it to control. Thank you. So had you asked uh, in this first scenario the, the question again, uh, the patient would have replied four again. Yeah, in state two, like the answer would have always been four. OK, great. Are there any other questions for Christopher? No, nope. so uh, we thank uh, Christopher for his presentation. Quite interesting. Thank you so much. OK, yeah, thanks a lot for having me and I'll stick around uh, for the next one. Great. So let's move on now to the second presentation by Dr. Jean-Noël Nikema, who's going to present clinical language processing, significance of ontologies for the analysis of medical texts. Dr. Nikema is an assistant prof professor at the Department of Health Management, Evaluation and Policy at the University of Montreal School of Public Health. Uh, he's a specialist in biomedical terminologies and ontologies. His research focuses on the quality assurance and, and interoperability of knowledge organization systems, KOS, and their application in NLP knowledge discovery and information integration. Uh, Jean Oeni Kema has a medical degree from the Nazi Boni University in Burkina Faso and a PhD in health informatics from the Université de Bordeaux. So, Dr. Nikema, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, would you like to share your screen, please? You can also unmute yourself. Okay, is it perfect? Can you see? It's screen? perfect. Perfect. Thank you so well, much. Thank you very much. Thank you for you to having me today. Uh, can I ask if we I can have um, uh, people turn on the the camera because it's a little disturbing for me to speak alone. <laughs> so it's if, you. if, if, if there is no problem for um, for the audience to do that, uh, I will be okay with that. So today will be also for my presentation will be less technique, I think, for than what we usually have in these meetings, because I will try to reconcile the needs of uh, control and efficiency we have in the biomedical domain 
With the limit of tools we we have to perform um, uh, an analyzed on clinical language. Uh, I take the part of ontology to describe how these resources can be used to to overcome or reduce the limit of clinical language, but also how they can be used to to improve and enhance the quality of information retrieved from clinical texts, but also their semantics. So to start my presentation, I will first discuss about what is a clinical language. So clinical language is an already um, a standardized language that contains some specific term and expression of the biomedical domain. We talk about the jargon uh, in, the, the, in the past presentation. And this term and expression are not used just to make the practitioner feel intelligent by using non-understandable words for the general population. The, this term are used to trigger some specific reflection and action when the practitioners communicate. And because this clinical language is based on natural language, the complexity and limits of this natural language um, are embedded in clinical language. We have some polysemia. Um, for example, if I am an anatomopathologist and I talk about the germ, um, depending on my context, I, don't, I do not need to add some precision. Everybody knows that I'm not talking about a, an infectious one. But outside of my context, uh, that can have a, another meaning. This word can have a, another meaning. We have also synonymia and homonymia in, in um, in clinical language, and most importantly, we have some imprecision and lack of consensus of the term we are using. Uh, to illustrate that, I can, for example, if I use the term nevus, uh, depending of my university of training, I can consider that as a benign tumor or not. So it's to, to to, to try to avoid this limit of clinical language that knowledge organization system take part of the health information system to enhance the standardization of clinical language. So what is a knowledge organization system? They are mainly um, a set of concepts of a specific domain, here the biomedical domain, and the related term used to describe them. There is a different way of describing knowledge organization system, but for me, I, I think the most important way of doing that is splitting them into two ways. Uh, the poorly structured one, like control vocabularies, terminologies, classification. And for this type of poorly structure, the structure is not important in the, in the semantic of the of, of the term. The term itself is sufficient to describe the semantic of the, uh, you want to convey, sorry. And the, the structure is not important. So sometimes, like in classification, we are just describing class, we have some hidden uh, semantics, but it's okay. With the term used, we have all the information we want. But conversely, we have some highly structured knowledge organization systems, like ontologies, that describe multiple, sorry, uh, that describe multiple um, uh, hierarchy, but also complex relation between this hierarchy. And most of the time, the relation are described using a specific language uh, that can be automatically manipulated by a computer. We are talking about um, ontology in this case. But of course, um, the, the word ontology is, is misused in the literature, and we can find, for example, some author calling the, um, the international classification of disease, who is, who that is clearly a, a, a classification with no semantic in its structure as an ontology. So it's difficult to agree on the definition, but the reason is, depending on the background we have, you can call things differently. But even if in my, in my presentation, I start saying, talking about ontology, and um, all the strategy that can be used will be, we will talk about knowledge organization system in general. So how these knowledge are used in practice, they are first used as a coding system. And this is a, 
a, a workaround. This help um, avoid the limit of clinical language by using a, a simple ID, a simple code. We can represent a medical uh, notion without um, um, grammatical error, abbreviation, despite the difference of language and all around the world. If I have the, the, this ID, I-50, I can share it and say that I'm talking about a myocardial infection. The problem of this process is that we need some coders, some coders that know, that have a great understanding of the knowledge organization system, that understand the patient condition, but, but also are interested in a specific granularity of description. And depending on the purpose of the coding of the, of the process, um, if it's just uh, for as an archivist, I can just uh, um, code as I can. But if you have some challenge of if I, I need to describe uh, the, the patient condition to be paid, it's different. My way of coding the information will be different because the granularity, the quality of the information can help me have more money, so I will do my best to, to do so. So when we have this type of information in our data, you know, for example, if I have E12 in, um, in a patient data, I, I will show you something quickly. If we look into uh, ICD-10, because I take this code here, we saw that it has explicitly exclude the pregnancy status of the patient. So here, if I have this type of information in my data, does it mean that um, my patient is not pregnant or the coder does not take the time to, to, to ask this type of information or do not have the possibility to, to understand the pregnancy status or not of, of the patient? That's the first limit, the coding polymorphism we can have. The other limit is the heterogeneity of knowledge organization system, where there is a lot of resource to encode data. And there is no clear rule and clear uh, knowledge organization system as an obligation for everybody to use it. So I can use known CD in an hospital. Another one will use the disease ontology here. And another hospital will decide to use the um, the international classification of disease for oncology to encode the data. And when we are here, we were obliged to go um, further in our reflection and perform what is called a knowledge organization system alignment. And when we look into the reality of real world data, we can find some very disturbing things. This is a type of label we can have in the reality. I did not invent it, this, this, um, this label. It's a, a real label uh, we found in the main hospital in Bordeaux in France. And in this hospital, they start early the, the informatization, the computerization of the, the health information system. And they go from the paper form to the electronic one. And they decide to, and when they perform the task, they, there is a character limit to enter the label. So they try to make some abbreviation as they can. And we have this type of, uh, of information. And they use it for like 10 years now or more. And came the time we need to merge different hospitals with this main hospital. And it's difficult to share this type of information using this label. So they decide to, to we decide to, to, to improve the, the label we have by applying some very specific uh, NLP um, uh, algorithm to be able to relate it to some reference one. To here it was the logical observation identifier name and code link that used for describe um, laboratory results, and we are able to retrieve this information using uh, this NUSI label with international um, uh, resource label with, that is validated by the scientific domain. And to stay in this scope, I, I, I need to talk about the most standing one in the, 
in the knowledge organization system alignment. It's the unified medical language system. And they start in 1993, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. And they use some very simple step to, to, to perform this al alignment. And it's, it's very simple. It's uh, well, well thinking and it's still used here to, to support natural, um, um, other tasks of machine learning. And how they do that? They just say that if we have a specific level in a knowledge organization system, we will just assign a, a code to each of them. And after that, we will say that if you have a, an exact match without making any process on it, we will create a new um, ID. And after that, we will add another uh, round of, uh, of normalizations, semantic stemming, lemmatization, uh, other stuff to be able to, to, to find a, a, a new ID. And after that, use the structure of the knowledge organization system to retrieve the same information, the same semantics, despite the d difference of description of the labels and even the difference of language. So we first time we create the knowledge organization system to avoid the difficulty of clinical language, but the heterogeneity of um, knowledge organization system lead us to create some, to apply natural language processing algorithm to align them. And now um, if you look closely in the real world data, we found a lot of free text because um, practitioners are not interested in creating uh, great data to be, to be used after. Uh, that's not the goal. They're, they're, they're trying their best to, to help the patient, so they don't want to take time to create some great data. And for this reason, we have a lot of free text, and we need to uh, annotate them and retrieve the information correctly, but still using um, knowledge organization system. So the, the, the strategy is called ontology-based entity recognition, but it's still, we can use everything to any knowledge organization system to, to process the, the information. So we want to try to, to retrieve information. And the first step is to, to identify the type of information we can have. Uh, for example, be able to say that ramipril is a substance, a tablet is a dose form. Uh, here we are talking about a, a strength, and here we are talking about a, a disease. That's the way we first process our information. And sometimes we can we can have different granularity of description. And for example, being able to say that ramipril plus and strength and tablet we are talking about a clinical drug when we have this type of um, of succession of, um, of of term. That can be a way. And after that, if you want to to retrieve correctly the information, we can replace our labels by knowledge organization system ID, uh, replacing remipril by this ID, the strength by this ID, and the, the dose form by this ID, and even the, the disease information by a specific ID. Um, I use um, an ontology we built here to describe the, 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 the drug information, and here is just so many city. So, if I have, for example, uh, ramipril and the tablet information, I can go to um, a, I would, an ontology-based uh, description. I will, I can just enter the information. Uh, for now, they don't have a strength to describe it, but we can just process this type of information, add the ID for everything, but still know that. In Canada, the only way to have a remipril with 2.5 milligrams is in oral. It's the, cell, the only one clinical drug we can have, and we can retrieve this information. And so, when we 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 do that, we can we can retrieve. Uh, correctly the information from our clinical text. We annotate also medical related article to retrieve the, 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 the great information. And in the biomedical domain, we, we, we do not directly use the nuclear um, uh, weapon. We 
we need to to come with a less complicated strategy before being able to um, to use some more complicated tasks if uh, the, the the very simple one cannot uh, uh, answer the question. So we have a lot of manual tasks. We all know that even for machine learning algorithms, we need some gold standard and mainly gold standard are, are provided by manual annotation. We can use classical natural language processing or mach machine learning algorithm to, to be able to perform this annotation. But um, the reality of uh, the do not depend of the strategy. Each strategy has some limits, but the main limit of um, the annotation process is knowledge organization system themselves. Because as you can see with previous example, sometimes we have some very noisy labels. And here for in red, we have the ICD, a description of, uh, of uh, uh, genome cancer in ICD. And in ICD, they, they, they say that if we have an ID starting with, with C, we are talking about a primary malignant neoplasm. So they do not take the time to, to, to write the, all the label, but can just say that, oh, it's geodenum. And geodenum is not to say that is the, is the organ, it's all the disease in, in this lo uh, location. And if you have this type of information, this type of elliptic labeling is very complicated to process and annotate, and annotate co correctly that, with that. But sometimes by trying to be very specific, very clear, um, labels in knowledge organization system are completely artificially created. And when they are created like that, we, they, we cannot find it in the reality of our data. And if you look into Google, I, I can do that if you want, but if you're looking for Google and looking for this information, we will not have the same amount of, of results if I use just, um, we have uh, like six million, that's a lot. I didn't expect that. Oh, just to, Add this one. Refer is not a lot. It's two hundred and forty-five. And if I change and use Jordanum cancer, we, the result will, will be different because it's it's better to use these in our data than this complex description we have in the in the. We have more. And if I change again. Have more results, and so depending of, uh, of of what is used in our label, it's difficult to to retrieve correctly the, the information. In addition to the um, to the label used in other organization system, we have a great problem of the definition of concept. We have, as you can see, sometimes it's just an information of oh, it's just um, a, a primary a, a, a concept here. Uh, sometimes we have some formal definition. Uh, with natural language definition and the complexity of the definition change from one resource to another. And most of the time it's difficult for even for humans to understand clearly uh, the intentional meaning of the uh, people who create the knowledge organization system and the other one that want to use it. And that is illustrated by this example here where we have, um, they try, they use uh, experts in the domain with biomedical gang background. They are medical doctors for, for and also they have um, a great experience of knowledge organization system. Here they try to use the SNONES CD and also the unified medical language system to annotate the data. And what they found is very simple. We, the, the agreement the agreement between these annotators is very low. Despite the understanding and the, and the long background in, in the domain, they, it was very complicated for them to, be, to agree on the correct annotation. Even if we go further in, and lose them um, and say that, yes, it's, it's not exactly the same, it's okay. Uh, we can't reach 70%. Um, that's something uh, when we think about the fact that 
that's the that's the way of creating a uh, gold standard as a way to train our our um, machine learning algorithm. Okay. So from for the annotation, there is a lot of difficulties, and also for for interpretation of the similarity measure. Sometimes we, we are interested in having uh, in having a threshold very high because um, if you compute a similarity between this type of substance, we will have a a a, a, a a big similarity between them, but the difference, the clinical difference between this type of kinidine and kinid is not, it's not the same at all. And obviously, sometimes we, we want to, to, to low, lower the, the threshold because uh, despite the difference, the complexity of description, we want to, um, to relate um, um, the information. And if we go further in the in vectorization, numerical vectorization of, of word of, of knowledge organization ID, we it's sometimes difficult to have the great answer of what is the great way of adding things, of, of describing correctly the information. Sometimes um, we can find some article talking about the um, the possibility of use uh, um, a general or specific train embedding or the, the classic and 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 uh, what is the name for that? I, I don't remember. But just to say that sometimes it's difficult to have the, the, the appropriate way of, of doing things because all the strategy have some some specific limits. And the way of improve of of improvement i can see is firstly uh, first um, improve the ontological foundation of uh, of knowledge organization system it's difficult because uh, we we reach a point of uh, of um, of development because um, when knowledge organization system became huge and, and with a lot of concepts, it's difficult to classify them and to have some great influence on the knowledge they, they contain. But there is a lot of work of way of better classify um, a knowledge organization system with web semantic uh, um, description uh, combined with uh, deep learning algorithm that give some, it's, it's, too early, but it, that that gives some some way of of seeing things or how we can improve the description without the restriction we have right now and be able to use um, a, um, a natural language processing algorithm and combine them with the structure of knowledge organization system to be able to to perform correctly. I saw this article this morning and. I was like, OK, that's very interesting because, as I mentioned previously, uh, annotation is very something complicated and the manual annotation take time. It's time consuming, it's uh, very difficult and for sure it's difficult to, um, to, to do it, uh, uh, to, to repeat this type of task. But we have some, some, some beginning of work around and that's the it was very interesting and I wanted to share this article with you. And to finish, we have a lot of possibility because um, if free text, of course, if you want, we have some information described with ICD-10 code uh, for a specific uh, disease is better than having a free text, but free text itself is structured. And that is also early, but we have already some work on converting uh, free text into knowledge graph. And if you can imagine that we can convert uh, free text into knowledge graph with a specific knowledge organization system support for the semantic, we can definitely improve the way of capturing um, um, uh, practitioner information and retrieve them to, to be manipulated by different type of algorithm. So, is a key for real world data usage in the health of med uh, precision medicine. If you want to have the uh, whole scope of a patient information in, 
in a hospital or in between different hospitals. It's a, the key factor is having some great uh, knowledge organization systems, some improve the way we are performing our natural language processing. And uh, it will be a combination of different approach to, to, for this objective. So thank you very much for, for your time. I hope this was an interesting uh, presentation for, for you. And if you have a question, my email is just here. We have all other um, training to go further in the place of knowledge organization system in data sharing, data processing, and that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nikema, for your presentation. Quite interesting. Um, so uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, like uh, for the previous presentation, you can uh, use the raise hand tool in the upper right corner to ask questions, or you can ask them in the chat. It's really your choice. You can ask your questions in, in French or English. It's not a problem. So uh, I think I'll start, uh, Dr. Nikema. Um, so uh, could you give us a, a few examples of the kind of uh, use cases for uh, a well-designed KOS that, uh, that would well-aligned, something that would be uh, shared between two organizations? Could you tell us about the, the kind of processes that, it's, that it facilitates? Um, the, the problem is the, there is no what's called a well-aligned uh, knowledge organization system. Th that's um, that's the, the point because we 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 try to to our best to align them when we when we have a specific task to do. But sometimes the alignment is complicated because we are we we try to align things that are not talking about the same thing, even if they are using the same word, the same, the same, um, the same philosophical background for, 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 for description. But people are trying to um, go together when they are sharing information together by building, um, for example, some common data models. And in these common data models, they choose the, the cost for query, um, I can give an example of OMOP, Common Data Model, for that is used for retrieving information from different um, organizations. And, and they, they will just say that, oh, listen, if you want to use OMOP uh, and want to make some specific uh, query, we just, and, and, clean, and for, the, for clinic, we need to use SNOMED CD. So people try to their best to align first um, the the cost use in the uh, um, um, in the department to Snowman City to be able to to participate to the to to some general query. So it's it's a it's a long process. There is no uh, great uh, knowledge uh, uh, knowledge organization system alignment that can be shared to everybody because of the alignment is performed for a specific task and it's difficult to have a general alignment of everything that can be shared. But UMLS is a, a, a well standing, it's free, we can use it. And if you, it's a, it's a great start to, of, and we have a lot of uh, um, uh, costs that are aligned uh, using the lexical step I present earlier. I see. Uh... In the chat, uh, Leo uh, says uh, the level of detail in a KOS is not in general well defined. One way to introduce KPIs is to make the problem less nebulous, is to index the KOS records by patient specific diagnosis, treatment, or outcome. So that's not a question, I guess it's a remark that, that Leo uh, proposes. If we can go further in this remark, that can be interesting. I'm, I wasn't sure to understand clearly, but if Leo is... Um, this is Leo. So mostly the idea is that 
if you can connect the level of detail in the KOS to specific outcomes for the patient relative to their, you know, for example, diagnosis or treatment or their health outcome, then you can start comparing and contrasting. treatment or outcome and then uh, for example you could evaluate whether this or that KOS or this or that level of detail in the KOS uh, works better or worse for the patients that you have you know within the large-scale data set that you have access to that that's very interesting because um, Sometimes uh, KOS are built for a specific purpose. Uh, for if you have ICD-10, it's just for epidemiological purpose. So we don't have the granularity you who we want if you use this type, and we want some specific granularity in the description of the diagnosis of your patient. And conversely, we have also Snow City, who is very specific, but it's very specific, where there is a lot of granularity if you want to clearly describe um, your patient, but sometimes it's, it's hard to understand the difference between um, what they try to represent. And I, I, if I can share my screen for one second, and um, for example, if I decide to, to represent uh, the difference between a fear and, um, and, uh, and anxiety, but, Summit City is one of the 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 the, the most described um, uh, the most described and the most granular um, resource in the biomedical domain. But if if I I try to understand what is here in in Summit City, I don't I, I can't understand that the description we don't have a description for fear, for example, and they, they have a difference between fear and anxiety. And can you um, have uh, described a difference? So for me, it's difficult to, to have a patient and make a difference between them. And for Sume City, Sume City did not help me to, to understand this type of, of, of difference. So the granularity is also a problem because sometimes um, even the the, the resource we think is uh, the well-defined uh, one, the well-granular one, do not always give uh, the appropriate definition for, for everything. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Tufik, uh, you have a question. Would you like to take the floor and ask it? It's really up to you. Okay, okay so... It's a very general question. Uh, simply, do you believe that we can learn an ontology from text? If yes, do you think that would be the solution for your alignment problematic? Um, in other words, uh, aligning ontologies. So, so there, there is already some work around uh, with the capability of um, of transforming uh, free text into a structure one and an ontology with concept and, and everything. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, because there is different way of, um, of, of coming to the problem. Ontology is, uh, is mainly based on concept. We need to be able to, um, to, to have a, a grid scope for each concept we try to represent, have a grid scope of description, have a grid scope of characteristic, have a, the appropriate term to design it. That's the way ontology are, are built. But when you perform a, a training, we lose the, the scope of definition of what we extract. So it we, we can extract it, but you need uh, to, to perform a, a first step of um, describing what you want to, to have the, the appropriate limit. And that's the reason I'm talking about the possibility of going from a free text to a knowledge graph, because I'm not talking about a knowledge, an ontology when I'm describing a knowledge graph, but they have a structure. We can describe a, a knowledge graph in LDF. They have some age, some, some nodes um, and everything, but to be able to relate them and base them on an ontology, 
who is more interested in the characteristic of each node and the semantic of a relation, that's, that's, um, that's a research program. For now, we are not here, but for me, it's the only way to perform and be able to uh, just enter our data in our, um, as a free as a free text, store them as an ontology and retrieve them for, for, for analyze after. That's, that will be the future for me. But for now, we are not uh, here. But it's a quite interesting question. OK, thank you very much. Welcome. Um, so, uh, Dr. Nikema, um, if if one uh, a researcher in NLP would like to try his hand at uh, aligning ontologies, what are the a good data set to start working on that problem? Something that could allow researchers to compare the results with each other, because there are so many ontologies, uh, they can be aligned in so many ways. Is there a way to? Is there a task that would be shared? Uh, yes, but I'm trying to, 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 it's my reflection actually, to try to, to give an answer to this type of, of question. Because um, when people came on this domain and say that, oh, I have, uh, uh, oh, we are using um, ICD-10 here, we are using ICD-9 here, I just want to use Numet City. Where can I find some alignment between them and just go from one ID to another and just use it? The problem is that, um, as I say earlier, that uh, we, we we perform our alignment using different type of strategy, and there is some free um, uh, uh, resource, some free alignment uh, outside. We can use it on Athena. We have a lot of resources there with a lot of alignment in between them with different strategy, manual mapping. Um, uh, uh, lexical mappings. We have a lot of we have, we have uh, some um, repository describing trying to pull everything together. UMLS is an example. We have BioPortal. We try to um, uh, to do the same thing, but for now it's difficult to say if um, the alignment you will find in these resource will clearly fit to your problem. That's that's a way we, we need to go to be able to, to describe alignment in a very general way and be able to change the, the, the purpose if it to 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 reuse them and apply what is called the the, the fair principle, findable, interoperable, reusable of this alignment strategy. But for now, it's uh, it's still a reflection. But we can find some 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 resource outside, but we still need to process them to be able to correctly use them. So an embarrassment of riches. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So are there any other questions for our speaker? If not, I think uh, we're going to conclude. Um, I'm going to, uh, to thank uh, our presenter once again. Thank you, doctor. Um, so we've had once again, two very interesting talks. Uh, we thank again Christopher and uh, Jean-Noël. Uh, it was a pleasure to welcome them today. Uh, I'd like also to thank my collaborators at IVADO, Mariam Tagmuti and Vanessa Alari, who organized these meetups. It's a lot of work for them and they do it very well. Thank you to both of you. Uh, Vanessa and Mariam is going, are going to contact everyone by email shortly in order to get suggestions for future meetups. We're always seeking new ideas for themes, for research projects that you would like to see featured during a future meetup. So don't hesitate. Please let us know. You just have to reply. It takes a minute and uh, we're going to be very grateful. Uh, once again, this event is, is recorded and will appear on our website, clickai.quebec and on YouTube. Uh, so I guess uh, I thank everyone uh, for their attending this meetup today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Stay tuned for more news. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all next time. And on, until then, uh, have a pleasant day and have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Everyone.